Tracy, come and sing your songs if you would, please. <coughs> About five years ago, about five years ago, um, Karen introduced me to this singer, um, extremely famous, Dottie Rambo, and I've grown to love her music. Um, this is called If That Isn't Love. <coughs> He left the splendor of heaven Knowing his destiny Was the lonely hill of Golgotha there to lay down his life for me. If that isn't love, the ocean is dry. There's no stars in the sky. This one is a brand new song for me. Karen has so talented and wonderful at picking out songs for me. This one's called Nobody Cared. <clears throat> no. 
nobody wanted him. Nobody cared. Nobody wanted him. No one shared in the promise he brought as a babe that night. Nobody, nobody, nobody cared. Nobody lauded him. Nobody sang. No crowd applauded him. No bells rang when he went to the desert to fast and pray. Nobody, nobody, nobody cared. But oh, how the thousands came when the bread was multiplied. And oh, how the hosannas rang at their king triumphal ride. And as long as the miracles flowed like wine, they called him wonderful. They came to dine. Nobody wanted him. No one remained. They only taunted him when his cross was stained with the blood freely given for a world in chain. Nobody Nobody cared. Thank you. Nobody cares. There is a corpse hanging on a cross. The body no longer has life in it. No heartbeat, no breathing, no speaking, nothing. And nobody cares. That would be an overstatement because God the Father still cared. It is a body, it is a corpse, but the Spirit has already left it. It has already gone. When the sun hang between the heaven and the earth, and he cried in that loud voice, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. The Bible says he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. I have no doubt in my mind whatsoever the spirit departed from that body and that body was any other dead body. Saving 
That body had been a sinless body up until the point in time that he took upon himself our sins. He had not sinned. So there is an exception. As that body is there, it was customary for them to leave it there and let it rot. Let them rot. The vultures would come and pick away at them and eventually they would decay. And flesh would start to fall off. Not a pretty scene. Pretty gruesome. We forget that this body was going to experience some things that every one of us have experienced. It already had experienced many of the things we had. But it is just another body hanging there right now. I want to read to you what the 27th chapter of the book of Mark says, beginning with the 51st verse. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. Now there's some things that happen. You know, we, we have a tendency to jump from the crucifixion to the resurrection. And forget about all the things that took place in between those last words of the Lord Jesus Christ upon the cross. And when the angel spoke unto those women and said, He is not here. I want you to understand this evening that as we look at that corpse, for lack of a better term, that dead body, he was not there. He had already gone back to the Father. The writer Paul, whenever he was writing, said, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Quicker than that. As he bowed his head and gave up the ghost, he made that trip from earth to heaven to his father. He didn't go alone. Even in death, he took with him a scoundrel. He took that fellow who was hanging there and said, Father, or said, Remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Remember me. And Jesus has said, Today, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. I want you to listen very carefully. The Bible says that as he gave up the ghost, the veil of the temple was rent from top to bottom. Now, the significance of that is this, that you can remember back in the Old Testament whenever that God had given them the law and whenever that he had told them all of the sacrifices that they had to offer for their sin offerings and, and, and for it, all of the different things that were taught under Mosaic law. And how that once a year the high priest was to go in to the Holy of Holies and that was veiled from everyone else. No one else was allowed to see it excepting the high priest. He only once a year went in there and he went after that he'd gone through all type of purification and rituals to be worthy to be able to go in there. And he went in and offered up a sacrifice for the sins of the people. Once a year. But he had to do that every year. I found that interesting as I was reading about this, that because there was such a pronouncement upon the fact that no one else was allowed to go in there, and if they were to go in there, it was immediate death to them. 
that the people had a, a, a custom that they would take and tie a rope to the ankle of the high priest so that when he went into the Holy of Holies, perchance that he were to die in there, they could drag him out because they couldn't go in. They would die. They couldn't leave him in there. They had to get him out of there. No one else was allowed to go in. I don't know that there's any record in the Bible of that ever having happened. But you see, sometimes what we do is we get interwoven in with what is scriptural, what sometimes is what we do traditionally. There's a lot of tradition that's from the time that Jesus bowed his head and gave up the ghost until we find Sunday morning when we glory, glory, hallelujah, he is risen. But there were some things that happened. The temple experienced the renting of the veil from the top to the bottom. No longer was that veil there to separate the people from being able to go into the Holy of Holies and to be able to approach God Almighty on behalf of speaking for their sin because the Son had gone in once and for all to be the propitiation for my sins and for your sins and for the sins of the whole world. He had made that sacrifice and it was no longer necessary that we have that offering that the high priest would take in. It was no longer necessary that you have the shedding of the blood of the lambs and the goats and the bulls and everything. If you go back and you read and you'll find that whenever that the people had gathered here in Jerusalem prior to Jesus going up here to give his life upon the cross, they had come there to celebrate the Passover feast. And you all know as a part of that they were to have to offer the sacrificial lamb, the Paschal lamb. And doing so, it required the shedding of the blood. I was thinking as I was doing a little reading, you know, you go back and, and you find where that when Jesus had gone into the temple prior to his going to the cross here, he was angry with the money changers who were there and what was taking place there, and he, he drove them out. And he wasn't angry just because that there was money involved there. He was angry because those people who supposedly were the religious people were taking advantage of those people who had come there to worship and to pay their vows unto the Lord. Now I'm also convinced that maybe he was a little bit upset with a lot of those people who came because when they went there to buy the lamb that they were going to offer as a sacrifice, they had no way of knowing that that lamb qualified as it was supposed to by the word of the Lord. They just paid for it, took it and offered it to the priest, and he took and slayed it up on the altar there, and the blood flowed freely. You know, sometimes I think we forget what a price has been paid for the redemption of our soul. What all it took for me to be able to be one of his children. And he did it, not me. When that temple saw the renting of the veil, and that was a very, very heavy garment, it was a very strong garment, it was made out of very heavy cord. It wasn't just an accident that it split from the top to the bottom. It started at the top and went all the way down. How thankful every single one of us should be this evening that we have the right as an individual to approach God through His Son, Jesus Christ, ourselves. You don't need me. You don't need somebody in a hierarchy. You know, you hear a lot of times they talk about the lay people and the clergy. There isn't any such thing Come on, people, wake up. What makes you think there's a distinction between you and me that you are, quote, lay people and I'm clergy? What does that imply? That there's a, there's a status there that does not exist in the eyes of the Lord. No. You have every right the same as I do. I have every right the same as you do to approach Him. 
he made that provision. Think back just a minute. As he was being prepared to go to the cross, what they do? They stripped his garments off of him, didn't they? And they put a robe on him. They wanted to make a king out of him. In mockery, they were doing it. But it didn't fit him. When he died, he died in the garments that he had lived in, that he had worked in, that he had worshipped in. And he died as a servant. As a servant. Nobody cared. Listen, there's something else that happened. I don't understand it all. I don't think most people understand it all. And most people don't even want to read over it. But it's here. It's in the Word of the Lord. The Bible says, And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after His resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. I thought earlier whenever that it was, the earth was darkened and there was darkness that people could not see and they heard that voice of the Lord as he cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That the people feared and trembled and could not figure out what was going on. Can you imagine how they must have trembled and fear must have taken hold in their hearts? Apostles, disciples, followers, heathen, all in the same boat at this point in time. Didn't understand what was going on. First of all, there's an earthquake. The earth literally shook. Frightening. But then, graves were opened up and bodies came forth. Oh, we've all got a lot of questions about, now, how, what, what, what was that? You know, how did that all happen? The Bible does not tell us other than just this. And I'm able to be able to say to you this evening, I accept it because God says that in His Word. I don't understand it all, so don't come to me and say, well, I want you to explain that to me. If you've got the explanation, you come and give it to me so I'll understand it too. But it was a phenomena that I'm sure stirred the hearts of many of those people. They didn't want to go out here and get this body. He's dead. His disciples, his apostles had forsaken him. There are a few women who have gathered here, but the Bible says they're standing afar off. They're watching to see what's going to take place. And then there's this earthquake. The graves open up. It's, oh, I, I don't know whether I believe that or not. I don't care whether you believe it or not. You believe whatever you want to. Someone was talking to me just the other day, and I said, you know what? They said, now, I know that you and I don't agree on everything. I said, that's, that's right, we don't. But I respect your right to believe whatever you want to. But I hope you'll respect my right to do the same thing. The Bible even says, Ronnie, that a person can believe a lie and be damned if they so choose. That's not my word. That's what the Bible says. But I believe that literally graves came open and bodies came forth. You say, well, I, I don't think they well, I think they were spirits. I don't care what you think. You think whatever you want to. The Bible says that the bodies came forth. How long has it been there? I don't know. How did that happen? I don't know. The Bible doesn't tell me exactly how it happened. I do know this one thing as I go over and read again in the words of the Apostle Paul as he wrote under inspiration of the Spirit of God. Then he talks about there's a natural body and there's a spiritual body and he also says that there one of these days that we'll have a glorified body and he's not talking about the spiritual body, he's talking about a physical body. We'll touch on that Sunday morning. So I'll give you a little heads up. My text Sunday morning will be the shortest one that I have ever used. I said that not long ago, didn't I? I gave you the shortest text that I ever used. Remember how many words it was? Three. How am I going to do it shorter? Two. <clears throat> not often do I always know in advance my text, but I've truly known this one. Now, what I can do with it, Lord will have to take care of that. I know what I could do with it, mess it up. 
But I'm hoping that he's got a message there for each one of you. Listen. Bodies came forth and they went through the city. Something else happened. They came out of the graves. And now when the centurion and they that were with him watching Jesus saw the earthquake and those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying, Truly, this was the Son of God. And many women were there, beholding afar off, which followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering unto him, among which was Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Jose, and the mother of Zebedee's children. I want to stop right there with that. I want to move to something else. He's hanging here. And if you go over to the 19th chapter of the book of John, let me get over there. 31st through 37th verses. So the Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the bodies should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day. For that Sabbath day was a high day. Besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Now what's he speaking of? They're speaking here that, that, that the high priest now and, and the people of the temple, they're going, they, they, they don't want their Sabbath, they don't want their holy days polluted. So they don't want these men hanging upon the cross here on their holy day. And so to speed up their deaths, they're asking Pilate to send and have the legs of these people broken. That would hasten death. Adds to the torture that these people have already experienced. What they don't know is one of them is already gone. One of them is already gone. Now listen. Then came the soldiers and break the legs of the first and of the other which was crucified with him. I love this. I, I can see this in my own mind and I hope that you can. I hope that you can see as they come here. There's three of them. One on either side of this man in the middle. They break the legs of one. Come to the second one. Uh -uh. They go over here and they break the legs of the other one. Why? Does the common sense tell you that you would have broken those legs in the order of those men hanging there? Well, one of the commentators says that probably what this was is that the cross that that middle man was hanging up on was a little farther back than the other two. That it wasn't in line and that was how that the two were able to be able to communicate with the Lord. I don't know whether that's right or not. But I do know this. They broke the legs of the one. They broke the legs of the other. God has a marvelous, marvelous plan. Truly, and when you start reading all the things that are in the Word of God that take place, how in the world could anyone not see the greatness of God and how that as He looks down upon all of us and all of the world and hundreds of years in advance knows what's going to take place and then people say, well, I don't know anything about the foreknowledge of God. I don't know whether I believe it or not. You, gotta, you just got to be out in the left field. Listen, I'll tell you why that they broke those legs and left that middle one. But when they were come to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side and forthwith came out blood and water. Remember I said the blood had stopped flowing. The heart had stopped beating. That body was dead. It's dead, people. 
I don't care how you try to glamorize it, how to try to picture it in your mind. It's as dead as anybody can be. And when a person is dead, they do not continue to have the bodily functions. If the bodily functions are still operating, they're not dead. I'm no medical expert, but I'm smart enough to know that. Didn't break his legs. But one of those little boys, just in an act of defiance and devilment, grabbed a spear and thrust it into his side, not knowing what he was truly doing. Listen. And he that saw it bear record, and his record is true. This is John. And he knoweth that he say what and knoweth that he saith true, that ye might believe. For these things were done. Now listen, that the scripture should be fulfilled, which saith, I've lost my place. A bone of him shall not be broken. You know when that started? Back whenever that the law was given unto Moses and they said, do you take that lamb and you put it up and you keep it separated until the time of the offering of it and then you come and you offer that lamb and you offer the blood of that but you do not break a bone in that body of that lamb. Here's the lamb of God. Nobody cares. But he is not going to have a bone of his body broken. They looked and said, he's already dead. He's already dead. There's no use to break his legs. They did not realize in saying that and carrying out that, that they were fulfilling Scripture. Now listen. And again, another Scripture saith, they shall look on him whom they have pierced. Ah, oh, yeah. Again. They shall look upon him whom they pierced. That boy had no idea that he was fulfilling a portion of the prophecies that God's servant had made hundreds of years before. In the book of Zechariah, it's spoken of that. Yeah. See, there are a lot of things that go on from the time that he bowed his head until he comes out of the tomb. We forget about those things. Maybe that's why we need to have Good Friday. Now then, there's something else that happens. If you turn over, well, you're already there, in the 19th chapter of the book of John, is 38th through the 42nd verse. How many of you here know about Joseph of Arimathea? <laughs> Yeah, you know who he is. How much do you know about him? I'm going to give a test here. I'm going to tell you you don't know very much because there isn't much about him. There's a little bit. He's mentioned by two of the writers of the four Gospels. But we don't know much about him. You know why we don't know much about him? Because he didn't want people to know about him. You see... Joseph of Arimathea, the Bible says he was a wealthy man. He was a member of the Sanhedrin. Custom says that he absented himself whenever the boat was taken to crucify Jesus. Now, whether that's factual or not, the scripture is silent on that. But he is a secret believer in the Lord. He's never let that be known. He's never let anybody know because he was afraid of the Jews. But God moves in his heart as God still moves in people's hearts today. And every once in a while, God's going to move in your heart. I believe that with everything there is about me. I'm not the only one that God speaks to. He speaks to each one of you as His children. He teaches that in His Word. He says, My sheep know my voice. Yeah, you know Him. I know Him. He speaks to you. 
Sometimes there are people who are fearful and afraid. And Joseph of Arimathea was one who had believed in the Lord Jesus Christ and he had watched and he had witnessed what all had happened, but he didn't say anything. He didn't do anything and we didn't know about him until finally he comes out. Now, I got to be careful using that expression today. But he does. He comes out as a believer. And what he does is he goes to Pilate and he begs Pilate for the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Nobody cares? Not till now. But he does. He cares. He goes to Pilate and he begs Pilate to allow him to go and to take that body down from off the cross. And Pilate grants him that blessing, that privilege. Pilate has called in some of the soldiers who said, truly, this is the Son of God. And he calls them in, and he wants to hear from them. You remember, Pilate had some reservations even before that he pronounced the death sentence. But he calls them in, and he asks them, he says, are you sure he's dead? We know he's dead. And we believe he truly was the Son of God. Pilate grants Joseph of Arimathea the right to take this body. Now I want you to just keep this in your mind. This man is a wealthy man. He is a man of prestige. But he goes out here and he climbs up. I, I don't know how. I, I assume he had a ladder. But he climbs up here and he takes that bloody body and he takes it in his arms. Doesn't bother him that probably he's ruining those clothes he has on. But he takes him in his arms and he takes him down from off the cross. Think about that. He didn't just walk up there and jerk him down. He loved him cared about him, but he had never publicly made any type of a profession until now. He goes up there and he gets him down from off of the cross. And while he's getting him down from off the cross, there's another guy that shows up to help him. You know, a lot of times we get this idea that we're the only one. That's been, that's been down all through time that man has thought, I'm the only one. I'm the only one who experiences this. I'm the only one who's having to do that. I'm the only one who's going through this, Lord. And we just put ourselves on a pity trip like you cannot believe. God always has a plan. God always has a person. I, I sometimes get to thinking about how soon, how soon it's going to be when I can say it is finished. And it'll happen. But when I said it, it may be over that quick too. I don't know. I don't know that. But I will guarantee you that it won't make any difference. When that time comes, God's work is going to go right on and it'll not even make a hiccup. Yeah. God has a wonderful plan. Had an old boy that he had already touched his heart quite some time before who he came to Jesus by night. He was a ruler of the Jews. He was a man who was knowledgeable. And he had said unto Jesus, How can a man be born again whenever he is an old man? How can he enter into his mother's womb a second time and be born again? And Jesus had said unto him, That which is flesh is flesh, and that which is spirit is spirit. Nicodemus, you must be born again. And all of a sudden, here comes Nicodemus, to help Joseph of Arimathea. Nicodemus comes out here 
to help him and he helps him get him down and he says you know what I've also got a little money and 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 Joseph was Arimathea had some money he was a wealthy man and so they took them and the Bible says that Joseph of Arimathea took this body I want you to understand people this is just a body now the Lord's not in there anymore he's gone Lord, we just spend so much time thinking that, that, oh, they're still here. Let me tell you something. When I die, I won't be here. Maybe in your memory, I hope, in your thoughts once in a while, maybe. But I'll guarantee you when I take the last breath and I bow my head and give up the ghost, I'll already be in the portals of heaven. Yeah. Yeah. And before you can say goodbye, there'll be others over there who'll say, come on in. Nicodemus comes here and he helps him. And they take the body and Joseph of Arimathea has linens. They wrap the body up in linen. That was expensive. Yeah. These women who were here, they, they, they were out there. They were sorrowful. They were, they were heartbroken. They were discouraged. But they didn't have any money. They were poor people. So God sometimes takes some of the rich people to help the poor. Yeah. We just got too many people today who allow the wealth to possess them instead of them possessing the wealth. God can use it if we allow Him. He does. Joseph of Arimathea takes in and they, they wrap the body up. They, they, they take some expensive uh, um, spices and ointments and, and do some preparation of the body. You know, they're, they're, like, they're like all the rest of us. They think, you know, we're, we're going we're gonna to save, we're going to preserve this body. Wrap it up. And then for this man who had never had a home of his own, a man who never even had a burial plot to where they could bury him, is a recipient of the generosity of this man by the name of Joseph of Arimathea. And he has hewn out a sepulcher or a place for his burial. We assume it was for himself. And he says, we'll take and put his body in my place. Think about that. Didn't even have his own grave site. Joseph of Arimathea, who had been afraid for most of his life to acknowledge that he was a follower of the Lord, steps up and he does care. Yeah. Now then, I'm going to, going to finish here just a minute. It's been a little longer than I thought it would be. Matthew in the 27th chapter. It says this. Now the next day that followed the day of the preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees came unto Pilate and saying, Sir, we remember that deceiver said, see, you see, they, they just cannot, they cannot bring themselves to acknowledge him as being anything excepting a deceiver. Now, these are your, these are your religious leaders, people. These are the hierarchies of the church as it existed at that time. Now, it's not the church the Lord established, so please don't leave here saying that. This deceiver, we remember what he said while he was yet alive. 
After three days, I will rise again. They knew what he had said. Saying, Sir, we remember that. Command, therefore, that the sepulcher be made sure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say unto the people, He is risen from the dead, so the last heir shall be worse than the first. They acknowledged they'd made a mistake. They acknowledged they'd made an error. They said, lest that this last heir be worse than the first that we've made. The other thing that they were wrong about was they were concerned that his disciples were going to come and steal his body's way. Where were his disciples? They had run and fled. They didn't care. They weren't concerned at this time. They were afraid. I'm going to come back and get him. Nobody cared. Pilate said unto them, Ye have a watch. Go your way. Make it as sure as you can. So they went and made the sepulcher sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. The Bible says that the sepulcher, that Joseph of Arimathea had provided had already been sealed with the stone. There wasn't any back entrance to come in and seal the body out. There wasn't any way for them to get through except through that entrance there. It had already been taken care of. That's okay. Pilate says, you go and you seal it up and you put a watch now that's what's happened between the last words of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's some of what happened. There's more. And I've already been a little longer than I had planned to be. I apologize if I've been too long for you. But listen, go home and read this again. And, 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 and try to put it into perspective with all of the nonsense that has been added to it from what actually happened to the way that we want it to look today. I, I am truly troubled and sorry that we have glamorized it to the point that it doesn't even resemble what actually took place. Nobody cares. But God in His great plan still moved in the hearts of people from time to time and caused them to care just as He does today. When we get to that point of where we say, nobody cares, I guarantee you God's already working in somebody else's heart in their life and He'll see the job gets done, whatever it may be. Yeah, He used all of these people he didn't just use those apostles. He had to bring other people in. Pilate was used of the Lord. My goodness, people, sometimes how thankful we should be that we have His Word. Thank you for your good attention. Thank you for being here tonight. I hope that you'll be here Sunday. I hope that the Lord will help me deliver the message that I believe that He wants me to use.